Let's do some news. Today is uh, March 22nd, 2019. If you're watching this on YouTube, it is March 23rd, 2019, which means two things. One, it is National Puppy Day, and I have a puppy, which I'll show you guys later, uh, again, for those of you guys watching the stream. And two, it's also Jen's birthday, my wife, who is still recovering from a hysterectomy and doing great, except yesterday she tried to go out by herself and, uh, and it did not work out. Um, because she's not physically capable of doing that yet, but she tried anyways, and so kudos to her for trying, pushing herself to the limits. It just wasn't a good idea. Uh, so, we've got a number of things to talk about today. Uh, starting off with a story from, uh, regarding Axiom Verge. Now, uh, for those of you guys who are not familiar with Axiom Verge, Axiom Verge is a Metroidvania that is very much, very, very, very much a Metroidvania. A lot of things try to put twists on Metroidvanias to try to create their own different, you know, well, oh, this is a kind of a Metroidvania, RPG, whatever, right? something. Uh, but this is, this is the most truest Metroidvania, I think, that exists uh, almost inarguably. Uh, now, that being said, I didn't play it because after, well, I didn't play any more than a few minutes because after just a limited time in the game, I was like, oh yeah, this is just like Metroid. And so I was like, well, I, I guess I just, you know, I just don't need to play it. Yeah, it's got, that's right. It's also like, you know, Bionic Commando-ish uh, elements as well. But uh, yeah, it was just, uh, it's, it's a game that is uh, well-liked by the masses. The developer, uh, the creator of it, Tom Happ, um, he has seen his fair share of, of, uh, of issues just trying to bring this game like out to everybody. Uh, it, did, uh, it did indeed come out four years ago. And then March 29th, it will see another release for the Multiverse of, uh, 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 Edition on the Wii U. And you're probably wondering, what? Are you sure you don't mean the Switch? What date? What's the date on this article? Well, no, I don't mean the Switch. I, mean, I seriously mean the Wii U. It took this long to resolve a bunch of legal issues uh, and distribution issues and everything in order to make this thing actually happen. And they're pushing forward with it because, uh, well, because it, it needs it need it needed to be released, and also because they needed to uh, uh, they need to basically continue to sell the game because Tom Hap, um, Tom Hap's uh, uh, well, as any developer, they need the money, right? Uh, but Tom Hap also has another unique uh, situation where uh, he has a he has a toddler who was born with a um, a relatively rare uh, uh, well he wasn't born with a disorder actually it developed because he had jaundice and wasn't treated correctly and so now he basically the kid is essentially like fully going to be able to develop uh, 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 mentally he's going to be developed but physically he's not going to be able to have controls uh, over his uh, control over his uh, um, uh, motor skills and whatnot. So uh, it's pretty tragic because it's something that is entirely um, preventable if it was diagnosed correctly. I think even Declan had jaundice when he was born and they were like, yeah, that's John. We're going to go ahead and treat it right now. And they treated him right away. Uh, it is a very common thing to happen uh, with, with newborns. Uh, so it's uh, as a father, I mean, I, 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 I would just be crushed if it was like, oh, hey, cool. You could have prevented this. And now my kid is going to be disabled for the rest of his life because because you didn't make the right call. Um, it's tragic, just absolutely tragic. Now, that being said, there's a lot of articles uh, that focus on the, the uh, on the money that they were supposed to get because of this fiasco um, that was supposed to be for the kid. And I, I want to I want to say that, yes, I think it's a tragic tragedy, like what happened and everything. There's a lot of bad decisions, but I also want to lay out this story in a way that you guys can see chronologically what happened, uh, because it's very difficult to find a chronological timeline for this thing. Let me tell you. Um, and uh, you guys can see what happened. So. So, yes, some people made some very dumb decisions, uh, but at the same time, it wasn't malicious intent. It was more like like negligence. <laughs> and just like, I don't know, laziness? We'll talk about that. So first off, uh, here's the here's the article where we actually realized that there was even anything going on. Well, not article, but this was the, uh, the first announcement. It says, after several years of struggle and ongoing legal battle over a huge amount of lost money at the hands of Badland Publishing, Axiom Verge is coming physically to the Wii U on Friday, March 29th at 10 a.m. 
It comes with, as you can see in the image here, I'll go and pull this up, leave this thing up full screen for now. Uh, it comes with a um, uh, dual CD set. So the audio soundtrack there. So if you like the soundtrack, it's there and available. There's a art book, there's a poster, uh, and there's also a map. And this is actually kind of cool because, you know, and this is one of the reasons why I supported IndieBox for so long. You can see the IndieBox boxes are still right there. Uh, <laughs> I supported them until they basically stopped. I have every single IndieBox release, except for the very first one, uh, which is very hard to find. Um, I have every single one because I support the physical release of games. You know, because the, the box always had like cool stuff. I know that nowadays it's a little bit different because everything's got to fit inside this little like CD case or DVD case or Blu-ray case or whatever the case is called, right? A little plastic uh, case. Uh, so you can't get all the fun stuff like a big old book, art book. Uh, you can't really get uh, a poster. Um, and so that was a nice thing about IndieBox is that IndieBox brought that shit back and they were like, hey, we could do this. And then they went, they stopped doing it. They, 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 I guess it was too much work or something, which I understand it was a lot of work that they put into these things, which showed because the quality of the product was amazing. Uh, and yeah, even, even non-indie titles, like for like, like Zengu saying the, uh, the WoW, uh, collector's edition boxes were great. Yeah. Even just the boxes themselves were awesome. Right. And inside you had an art book and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, so this is. This is something that I fully support. I would much rather have a physical copies of games than digital copies on platforms other than PC. I don't buy them on PC because I don't have an optical drive. Who has an optical drive anymore? Um, and so, so this is, but this is something that costs money, lots of money. And so let's go to the timeline and let's start with June, 2017. I'm just gonna leave this image up here for now because everything else we're talking about is gonna be all timeline stuff and I'll switch to something else as we get to a certain point. So June 2017, Badland Games creates Badlands Publishing to keep distribution and publishing separate. That's something that's important to note. That was in June of 2017. Now sometime in mid 2017, I can't find the exact date on this, but Badland Games makes a publishing offer, quote, we couldn't refuse as Dan Adelman, who's a producer for Axiom Verge says, uh, and they made an offer that could not be refused because the CEO was sympathetic towards Tom Hap's disabled son, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, also offered, to, and he also offered to contribute seventy-five percent of their cut to a trust fund for Hap's son. So he's basically saying, and this is because we find out later that uh, the CEO of Battling Games had a son who was um, uh, who had health issues up until uh, I guess recently, a couple weeks ago where he was on medication or something like life-saving medication, essentially, uh, up until a couple weeks ago. So he was, he was sympathetic towards Tom Hat because, you know, they, they had, they, they shared, uh, this particular, uh, issue. So, uh, I can understand from that perspective where it's like, oh man, I want to help you out because I wish that somebody was there to help me out. So here's what I want to do. I want to do this. And I want to do this. And I want to do this. So that all to me, that reads like, okay, this guy's trying to do, trying to do right by another father. Awesome. Uh, July 2017, um, LGR, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> I actually wrote LGR, let me fix that. Uh, Limited Run Games pays Badland Games $78,000 for 6,000 Wii U copies. Now, there's, they're also handling publishing for, uh, and distribution for other titles for uh, uh, PlayStation and, uh, and everything else. Uh, but the, but this is speci specifically focusing on the, uh, the Wii U here, because this is where the, the problems were. Now, if you're wondering what the cost of that is, is $13, $13, uh, per copy. Uh, if you just include the, if you just take the math at 78, 78,000 divided by 6,000 copies, uh, for Wii U, uh, that was in July of 2017, nothing happens. And then January, 2018, they get a notice from Nintendo that says, hey, we, we got we to gotta do something about the age verification on this, uh, uh, or the, I guess the age, um, uh, um, like a Peggy, Peggy 18 and 13. It was like teen, teen, it was like E10 plus, uh, which is everyone but 10 plus uh, or teen. They couldn't figure out which one they wanted to do. And I guess there was something they had to make uh, to the, a change they had to make to the game's code or something, or to something kind of dialogue, perhaps, uh, I'm guessing there, um, that would make it, um, fit into a particular category. So that was a small snag because that actually had nothing to do with the overall timeline because they didn't necessarily, like that wasn't necessarily the actual holdup. Um, nothing happens again until September, 2017, when the, I'm sorry, this is actually backwards. I'm sorry. Uh, July 20, July, 2017. I should put this in my timeline wrong. Fuck. Uh, July, 2017, they paid the money, right? Uh, $70,000 for 6,000, uh, copies of the Wii U game. 
Uh, September 2017, a few months later, Bank of Spain accidentally issues a notice of non-payment to Badland Games and locks credit lines with other banks for them, essentially locking them out of any kind of funding. So because of a bank error, they essentially had no funding except for whatever money they had in the bank and, of course, the $78,000 that they were given by uh, Limited Run Games. And so then fast forward to January 2018, that's when the issue with Nintendo came out, uh, and then they fixed that super quick, and then throughout 2018, Badland Games is struggling to regain footing because they have no fucking funding, and they had to recover from having basically no holiday season because they couldn't do anything. Um, they're renegotiating deals, they're liquidating assets, they're essentially struggling um, to stay afloat. And to continue to, you know, to, to put out products. The, uh, throughout 2018, Battling Games fails to regain footing, up. Uh, sorry, um, April 2018, uh, Limited Run Games asked for a refund, because this is now, like, we're going from July 2017, where they paid the money, to April 2007, 2018, where LRG asked for a refund, or $78,000 worth of product for other platforms. I don't know the details of which platforms they chose, whatever, but you guys know what I'm saying. They was like, okay, look, if we can't get the Wii U version because the Wii U is super fucking old now because it switches out, let's just get, you know, copies for another thing. Um, a week later, they gave a pay or get collected. So they didn't hear anything for a week. This whole time, Battling Games is basically ignoring everything. They're like, yeah, we want to help. We want to do all this stuff. They take the money. And then the bank error happens. They end up having, get all their assets, basically having no fucking money. Uh, and essentially they just go radio silent for months. May 2018, a month after the April 2018 uh, um, refund or $78,000 with the other product thing. May 2018, Badlands finally responds and they say, yeah, I would like to, we would like to go ahead and get you guys a non-Wii U uh, option. And let's go and have a call. We'll, we'll discuss the specifics of this whole thing. Uh, and so uh, LRG actually agrees, but Badlands never shows up to the call. They did not collect $200. <laughs> it was the worst kind of bank error, actually. It was, it was, base, it was essentially almost company destroying. Uh, and so they, uh, they agreed to get on a call. And then they never show up. October 2018. <laughs> we went from May to October. And they didn't show up for a call. They, they, they sent out requests. Completely ignored. And then October 2018. Uh, Why wow, really to put LR, LGR on everything here. Man. Just, uh, what is LGR? I really got to confuse something else. Um, so uh, Limited Run Games files a suit against Badlands. And they respond that they have recently shuttered Battling Games, but not Battling Publishing. Remember, we had, I remember there's a distinction there. Um, and they say that they have actually transferred the rights back to Tom Happ, the developer, which apparently was news to LRG. So, but this apparently happened right around that time, which is why they were responding because they were like, well, we're pretty much defunct now i might as well go and get back to his publishing thing so they wrote them was like hey you know what remember that thing that we uh we took money for that we didn't necessarily provide the service for uh, in return well we're just gonna give you back the the distribution rights for that and you guys can just kind of handle yourself um and then the suit has been filed right december 2018 they still don't show up they basically just don't show up to anything it's almost like they don't exist they still don't show up and uh the judge obviously defaults against them. They lose and they have to pay, repay the $78,000 plus, I think, $3,848 or something like that in interest and fees. Uh, they lost. They, why did they lose? Because they didn't show up to court. <laughs> they didn't show up to court. Now, a lot of this info has been derived from the, uh, uh, from one from uh, Living and Run Games and also from Dan Adelman, who had his own thread where he discusses uh, a lot of this, where he says, you know, Living and Run just, just announced all this stuff. We've been quiet about it until now, but Battling Games ripped us, me and Tom Hap, off as well. Here are some of the details. He basically goes into um, into, into details about uh, uh, about what happened and all this. Um, to which the actual CEO, uh, Luis uh, uh, Quintins, actually responds as well, saying that, uh, and I'll try to summarize some of this stuff here, but he basically says that he has never refused to pay a debt. He's never refused to pay a debt. 
He just hasn't paid it, apparently. Uh, they just didn't pay it. Um, but he also admits that he, that he was not proactive enough to make it make something work. Not necessarily those words, but he does say uh, somewhere in here uh, that he that because of his inactions, that basically this all this stuff happened. And really, that's that's if you think about it, let's think about it from Quentin's perspective from battling games. They <clears throat> they separate and make two companies. They accept the money. They're going to go and like do everything's supposed to be working fine, right? They're supposed to go and uh, uh, get um, get $78,000 worth of Wii U titles uh, printed and packaged and ready to go. Uh, then the bank error occurs. They process them. They, 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 uh, um, they fault them for non-payment and it essentially locks up their funding. So they get no money for, you know, months. It's because it's a two-month cycle for it to update, right? <clears throat> $3,675. Okay, cool. So, yeah, sorry. I was off by a couple hundred bucks. I totally guessed there. Uh, so the, uh, and so, uh, uh, so he, they basically have no money. You know that they're probably spending the money that they uh, got from them in order to just keep everything afloat, right? Uh, it probably wasn't a decision that came lightly, but also the wrong decision because it wasn't necessarily their money to be spent on that kind of thing. Uh, when you give a company money for a service, you're supposed to get a service back, and they opt not to do that. We don't know. Because it never went to court, we will never know what the actual finances were and where that money went and what happened. If it actually went to court and he brought in all of his financial records and everything to say, hey, this is what happened, this is where we're at, blah, blah, blah. He probably knew that they were going to lose anyways, and he didn't want to necessarily expose the company any more than it already would be. Or maybe he thought that it would none of this stuff would necessarily come to light because it's like, you know what? Maybe it'll just get like kind of just swept under the table and no one's really going to think anything of it. Um, and that's not the case because the story is everywhere. <laughs> so that, that totally backfired. Uh, so there's been... Plenty of articles all over the place. Games Industry Biz did a couple articles. The Verge articles. Kotaku did articles. Everyone's doing articles basically discussing this whole story. A lot of it hinges on, uh, what do they say? They say that he literally took money away from a disabled toddler. Um, and and I, I put quotes because that is, that's what they wrote. Um, <clears throat> and, and I feel like that is, that is a terrible thing. I also feel like it's a little more complicated than that. But ultimately... Ultimately, Badlands did indeed make some pretty stupid decisions in just not communicating. Just all they had to do was just communicate and say, hey, our bank locked up our assets. We can't do shit. We're, we're frozen here. We can't. We don't have the money to survive. We have to do this stuff. We promise we'll do blank. We'll do something, whatever. They could have communicated it and they chose not to. And then all of this stemmed simply, simply from not communicating. And, and now we have from June 2017 all the way to December 2000. Sorry, well, actually, we should go ahead and count until the release date. So basically from June 2017 to March 2019, we're essentially and, and now we're like, you know, we're, we're in a whole nother console generation and we're releasing a game finally for last generation's console. Um, wasn't uh, Axiom also caught up in that stolen gray mark? I, I, yeah, I, Tom has been caught up in a lot of different uh, um at a lot of different, I guess not controversies, because I don't want to, I don't want to paint it as like he is involved in these things. But because he is a, because Axiom Verge is a very successful indie game, like most successful indie game developers who are trying to get the game out on different platforms and they're making all these deals and everything, uh, they are they are looking at it as, um, or say so there there is there's more op of an opportunity for uh, for issues to come up. And some of them can be extraordinarily damaging because it's like seriously a handful of people that made a game and now they're trying to bring it to a public state or to a, a, a worldwide stage via a shitload of platforms. So, yeah, like I'm sure Tom Happ has been through a lot of stuff just with this one game. But this is not this is not um, inconsistent with what we've seen with previous uh, developers who are, you know, indie developers who make it to the big stage. Phil Fish is a great example, actually. But in his case, I feel like Phil Fish bought a lot of that stuff on himself um, because of um, he just wasn't necessarily compatible with Twitter. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's just it's just something that happens with it. Whereas if if uh, Axiom Verge was developed by a AAA company, 
then all of these lines would already be established. Distribution lines would be established, promotion, all that stuff would be established. Um, we wouldn't, all the platforms, everything would be set up because they already know where it's going because, oh yeah, we're AAA. So we, we, we this is where we distribute to basically everything. Uh, and maybe exclusive to Epic for a year, whatever the fuck. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely a huge difference whenever you have like a single person where everyone's trying to take advantage of them, kind of like a rec recording artist, for example. And it's funny because this actually reminds me of what it's like to be a recording artist, artist on a label where you're basically getting fucked by everybody. <laughs> the record label, the distribution channel, uh, everything is trying is, is trying to take a buck off of something you created. And that's and, and when you're a, a, an independent producer or an independent uh, game, video game developer, uh, you are going to run into a few more walls, GG cookies, uh, because you are alone in this. And so, yeah, Tom App has been uh, involved in a few handful of things over the past four years or so. This is the game released. Uh, and it's not not his fault. It's just because of the way the industry essentially tries to take advantage of people. And even even this case where you have battling games who, uh, who because they just decided, well, we're just not going to communicate these issues. I don't know what the purpose of that was. Maybe they thought, I mean, maybe they thought that uh, they would understand or maybe they were embarrassed to talk about it. Maybe he was like, wow, this is really embarrassing. I'm gonna try my best to get his money back, but I don't wanna tell him anything yet. So I'll just try to get him up. I'll probably hit him up. Next time I wanna email him, I'll be like, hey, I got your money, right? But that never happened. And so they kept postponing it, kept postponing it. And the next thing you know, it's like six months later. There's no excuse for this, by the way. Again, communication is key. But um, but yeah, I mean, still, if it was a AAA you know, game developer, <laughs> This probably wouldn't have happened because they would have been like, hey, we're just going to send our lawyers at lawyers at you guys like right now. <laughs> like just just send them out right away. Uh, I think people do understand that communication is key. It's just more convenient for some to ignore that. So when the Internet pulls the pitchforks on them, justifiably, usually they use the communication thing as a scapegoat. Well, in this case, I mean, well, in this case. It could have very easily been resolved because communication was happening. It was very one way since uh, July of 2017. And so the fact that it took until December of 2018 to really get any kind of firm closure, because that's when the suit, uh, the judge defaulted, and um, or he defaulted because he didn't show up to court. Um, the fact that it took that long is ridiculous. And it could have just been resolved with just like, hey, man, like we're going to work our, our butts off to get you back your money. But maybe they shouldn't have spent it in the first place, but by not going to court, they don't have to necessarily expose any of the finances. So we have no idea where that money went. So as far as we know, and we could probably speculate, they ran, they ran low on funds because of the bank error. And from there, it was just a series of really dumb, really, really dumb uh, 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 actions taken from this. Um, oh, Chris and Plo. Is there, is there a slush? Is there a slush pot for that? Uh, yeah, so... If you want, if you want to continue supporting, if you want to support Tom Hap and, uh, and his kid, uh, you could do so by, and he actually says himself, you're basically buying his game. So if you want to, if you want to support, buy his game. I think I actually already own Axie Verge through, I think I got it through IndieBox. I know I have a copy of Axie Verge on something. I don't know what, um, but, uh, but yeah, I might have to pick it up again just to kind of throw some support at the guy, you know? It's rough. It's rough being any dev, as we've learned over the past 10 years. Any dev life is the worst. Do not wish that upon anybody. <sighs> cool, we made a really popular game. Now the whole world hates me. Yeah, that's kind of the way it happens. <laughs> uh, Wii U version limited to 6,000 copies were available worldwide. Yep, exactly. So yeah, if you want to get a Wii U copy, you got to do that. You got to do that shit like stat because there's only 6,000 copies. Uh, and remember... Something I actually excluded from this I, that I feel is worth mentioning, the, um, they, they did put, uh, limited run games had to basically pay for everything again. So if you figure the initial, the initial version was $13 per copy, let's just pretend that they're paying the same amount for the next one. That's $26. The game sells for $29.99. You know that the storefront is going to get a cut from that. So... As they've said, they've put probably about $120,000 into this whole thing because of like time and investment for like all this stuff and promotion and all that. Uh, and of course, buying the same, buying the same disc twice. <laughs> so, and they probably may never get their money back from uh, Battling Games because Battling Games, which the, what, the judgment was actually against Battling Games and Battling's publishing. But, you know, how long it takes for them to get their money back, we'll see. Yes, uh, Cold Knight, 
in February, second week of February, or first week of February, uh, Axiom Verge was one of the free games on the Epic Store. I don't know how Epic Store handles their um, uh, paying for that kind of promotion. Uh, so I can't really speak to that, but I'm certain that, uh, that Epic paid something for that. There's no way in hell they're going to give away the game for free, um, and not pay the developer for it. That would be an even bigger story. Uh, as much as I like to rag on Epic for a number of things, I don't think that they would, uh, <laughs> they would just cut some kind of deal where it's like, but exposure, everyone's going to know about your, uh, everyone's going to know about your, uh, your game now. Which is, isn't that nice? Don't you want that exposure? Can't you pay your bills using exposure? Nope. All right. Let's see. Um, let me actually go to, uh, actually I don't have a, a B-roll clip for this. Let me actually go and pull this up. Stadia announcements. We're going to talk about Stadia here, but I don't actually have the announcement up. Um, and I'm just going to basically have this running in the background here. That way we can, uh, just oh car okay okay oh it's the freaking light mode because it doesn't remember that stuff dark theme is on because i don't want complaints from you guys all complaining all right so i'm going to let this run in the background we talk a little bit about stadia or stadia stadia uh i for sure was that guy we're gonna pay you an exposure yes seriously that's that's what i that's what i want to believe but i know that they're not that they're not that fucked up um epic pays the devs for the free releases yeah of course they do of course they do uh let's see so, Stadia. What is Stadia? If you guys uh, were living under a rock, which I kind of was because I had no idea what this was the day it was announced. Everyone was like, oh, what do you think about Stadia? I was like, I don't fucking know what that is. <laughs> I thought I just making up words. <laughs> so, uh, Stadia is Google's newly announced video game streaming service. Imagine Netflix, but video games. Imagine OnLive, but not quite. So, what is OnLive? Uh, OnLive is a, what was a video game streaming platform where you can, you could basically rent games, um, and stream them from their data centers. And then you could play them on your, uh, on your PC or wherever. The problem with OnLive was that one, you had to, you basically rented the games, even like buying, I think was like renting or something. I think the prices were not agreeable for that at all as well. Um, they tried, they tried a whole bunch of different ways to try to make OnLive work. And it just didn't because ultimately, and even though it was like 2012 or so when that came out, 2011, uh, it still wasn't viable yet. We didn't quite have the technology <laughs> yet uh they were dead yeah, they were uh, as mr jukes put it uh way ahead of their time way ahead of their time they had the the idea before the technology was capable and they tried but failed uh and so now here we are some six seven years later and we have stadia being announced from google google has obviously some pretty robust data centers where they're going to have uh probably some pretty robust systems running video games to stream on your particular platform but how does it work how does it work so take any google google related device or os or uh browser for example chromecast hardware uh chrome the browser uh android basically every phone in the world <laughs> and some refrigerators, uh, and YouTube, which is available, of course, everywhere as well. You can, the idea is that you'll be able to stream games to any of those devices or anything that could run any of that software, Android, uh, 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 YouTube, and of course, um, um, Chrome. But how does that, but like, how, how, how does that work with your controller and everything? Well, the idea was that you can move and they just demonstrate it here a little bit as this is playing in the background you can they can move uh from a mobile device to your television to your pc and you don't have to do anything other than essentially relaunch whatever the app is in that particular uh, uh software or that uh that piece of hardware now why does this how, do, how does this how can we liken this to something else um youtube is a great example if you watch if you're signed into youtube on a bunch of different devices you know that this is the case. Whenever you watch a video on your phone, and let's say you're halfway through and you, you turn off your phone and then you go to youtube.com, it'll pop up and it'll show you, up, usually in the corner there, on the first line, it'll say, continue watching, and you could continue watching your uh, whatever you know, movie or show or video or whatever on whatever device you switch to. 
it's kind of an interesting system. Why? Because it locks it all to your actual login. So it keeps track of what you're doing all the time, which sounds creepy when you say it that way, but that's pretty much the way the technology works. And that is also the way this service is supposed to work in that it's gonna, cause it's just streaming video to you. So all they have to do is just remember what your account is and then they can stream the video to you, right? But the controller is the interesting bit. The controller, the teraflops has popped up. Oh my God, look at those teraflops. Uh, the controller does not talk to the console. It doesn't talk to the console, because there's no console, right? Again, this thing, everything is your console. Come when you, And when you think of it like that, it's like, whoa, this is the future. Everything's a console, that's amazing. Uh, but the way that the controller works is both intriguing and also very worrisome. The controller will connect to your Wi-Fi network, and instead of talking to any one of your devices to play the game, it talks directly to the Google Data Center, and the Google Data Center will then relay with your, your actual commands through the video. <coughs> that sounds really cool, but also the latency that would be involved with that. They're saying that the latency is going to be essentially non-existent but we know that not to be true. Latency to them probably means, you know, how much, how long it takes to get from the front door to the servers, back to the front door. Uh, but we all know once it hits our house, we're gonna have some kind of latency. You're gonna have some kind of latency. The rest of the tech, and I have a couple bullet points here I wanna go through because it's actually pretty interesting is that uh, one of the cool ways you can actually launch the title, or launch a game, you notice they have Doom Eternal there showing right there. They're talking about Doom Eternal is basically be able to play uh, at 4K, uh, 60 FPS, which is insane. I, I don't even know if my PC can play, <laughs> can play Doom, you know, Doom 2016 uh, at 4K, 60 FPS, but, We'll get there. So the uh, the idea is that you can launch a game directly from YouTube. So if you go and you watch a video, let's say you watch a video uh, any for breakfast and you get uh, uh, and, and a pop up says, play this game right now. You sh technically you should be able to play that game. I don't know how they're going to work with pricing and all that because I've talked about pricing. Uh, what is this? What do you got here for me real quick? Let me take a look at this digi. Uh, I did a latency test. Let's see. Let me see if I get right to some answers here because I'm not gonna be able to read this article while we're doing this. Uh, do, 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 179 milliseconds. We peg button to pixel latency at 179 milliseconds. Yeah, that's good for turn-based strategy and card games. Great for that. Yeah, let's keep going. So the, uh, <laughs> we knew there's gonna be some kind of latency and the discussion about it, there not being any kind of latency. We knew that, that was kind of a, that must have been some internal something that they were testing there. Uh, and so, yeah, there you go. Uh, Jaru says um, that 178 milliseconds is 10 frames at 60 FPS. So that's a pretty significant amount of time for that. Going back to the, actually how you play the game, because I feel like some of this stuff is pretty cool. Maybe it's a bit too soon for it because technology and whatnot, right? But they're definitely not as bad off as On Live was some seven, eight years ago. Um, <clears throat> viewers can join your game while you're playing it. You can look up YouTube, guides, I guess like in the actual browser, in the actual gameplay area, which I think is really kind of amusing because remember when <laughs> like posting guide, I, mean, I remember this because I used to do this, posting guides uh, for various video games uh, sometimes would actually result in you not being able to uh, monetize a video because it included gameplay. And now they're like, oh, thank God we have all this gameplay powered uh, uh, centric, you know, tutorials and everything because we could pull it right up whenever you want to whenever you need it on uh through their new service through stadia and so they'll be able to use that uh going forward so i'm so glad that they didn't pay me for those videos but they're going to use them for people that need them for their new service it's awesome uh 1080p 60 if you want to stream as a 1080p 60 oh yeah by the way yes ps now does already have that um it's so it's not entirely new all right the playstation now we remember this was like some three years ago or something like that four years ago uh, it was a big, uh, they announced it during E3 and everyone was like, whoa, there's all these cool features of being able to basically stream it and then also join in all, with that person and play, uh, through the stream and all that, uh, and actually take over the controller and everything. And that was a lot of, a lot of really cool stuff they talked about some years ago. So you can do that with PS now, if that's uh, if, if you want to, if you really are looking for a place to play a game where you could share with somebody else and let somebody else play it for you. Um, there's been no discussions whatsoever for fees or costs. So we have absolutely no idea how much it costs. We don't know if it's a subscription-based service. We don't know if it's uh, 
uh, a per diem or a la carte where you basically go through and you just buy, you know, the individual games that you actually want to play packages. We have no idea. Absolutely none. Um, we know they're going to be taking advantage of like, as you talk about right here, they have a clip system that you can be able to upload directly to YouTube, which is great that they're doing that because I feel like having clips is a, a, a mainstay with, uh, uh, with the just video game streaming, thanks to Twitch. Uh, and it's weird that even like YouTube, you can't make clips on YouTube, even though they have the videos. I feel like sometimes it'd be great if somebody could just make like a clip of a YouTube video to highlight a certain part and maybe it shows up underneath your video or to the right of your video or something like that. So people could just maybe watch a 30 second clip uh, from that video. Like, and they just basically just bookmark where those, the beginning and the end is and just play that video by itself. But they don't have that system. Maybe with the, with this, they'll, they'll be able to put it in. So anyways, 1080p 60 requires a 25 megabit connection. And to put that into some kind of perspective, right now I'm streaming at six, mm, six megabits. I had to look real quick. <laughs> so yeah, I'm streaming at six and a, six and a half. It kind of fluctuates depending on how much movement's on the screen right here. Let me see. Come on. And 60, 600 kilobits per second. Uh, and so this actually requires four times more in order to uh, uh, stream at 1080p 60, which I thought was interesting again, because I stream at six and I feel like outside of, you know, using the warp fe feature in, uh, in no man's sky, I could do a fair bit of gaming, uh, at Twitch's stream quality. So I don't feel like the 25 megabit is a must have a must requirement. I feel like that could be scaled. So even though that was part of the IGN state of that, right? I feel like I would still take that with a, with a, with a grain of salt because, um, well, because we know we could get decent enough quality at probably half that. Uh, again, outside of, you know, uh, No Man's Sky warping from between uh, inter between uh, different uh, chunks of a certain system. Uh, let's see. One thing to note, too, we already talked about PS Now, and they're talking about all the different games and whatnot, but uh, outside of uh, uh, PS Now, there's also a number of other competitors that are going to be hit the market very soon. Uh, you have... Um, Microsoft has their X, X, uh, X game, X, damn, I forgot what it's called. Microsoft has a game, a video game streaming service. Uh, Walmart has a video game streaming service that they're looking to get into. Snapchat has a video game streaming service that they're going to be looking into. Not necessarily direct competitors, but they're still technically video game streaming services. So not an Xbox Game Pass, it's, a, it's like X something, I forget what it's called. Um... Yeah, I really wish I could remember what the hell it's called. Is it xCloud? Maybe it's xCloud. Um, so everybody is going to start getting in on this, apparently. So it's great that they're going to, they want to be like the leading. They're going to, you know, come out. Yeah, Amazon also working on theirs. Everybody's working on one. So I definitely feel like while Google is the, not first, but, you know, they're the first major company to do this and release it. Well, they're, well, you know, we'll see when it comes out. Uh, I don't really count PS now, and I also don't count Sega Channel, all right? Before someone throws that out there, right? I don't count anything before this because nothing has really worked as solid as we'd hoped. If this comes out and it works great, which the data with the with, with 179 millisecond lag or whatever, that doesn't necessarily sound too promising, but... Um, yeah, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. By the way, Sega Channel was awesome, actually. Sega Channel actually did kind of work because it just downloaded the game. Uh, it didn't actually process and stream it to you. So that doesn't really... They, I wouldn't really even count Sega Channel at all because all it was is a service that you could essentially just download the games for. Actually, a friend of mine had Sega Channel for a bit. Um, yeah, wow, that was, that was a long time ago. I actually kind of remember the UI for that. Huh, my worry is that if it works, it will render personal computer useless. You know what? Is that a bad thing, though? especially after a few years, right? Maybe after a few years, you don't necessarily have to worry about having the top of the line hardware and all that. It was just, it, that just, maybe it's not even a thing anymore. Let's go ahead and loop this again if we can. It's just, after a few years, like right now, uh, you know, my, my PC is doing great. But, and so if they release this and it works amazing, it's like, oh, cool. I could play this on anything. And then if I was just, if I was just somebody who played video games, and then, like, not a content creator, not doing photography, not doing all the other bullshit. Um, then I might be like, you know what? I don't really necessarily need to have a, another $2,000 crazy gaming machine. I don't necessarily have to do that. I can just buy, like, a super nice TV instead and just 
do that and just be able to play whatever I want uh, using whatever service it is. Uh, is this that time? Is it, is the future now? Is that it? Uh, we don't know. Like that's we we'll have to wait and see how this actually performs. Uh, I do think it's interesting that they want to launch with uh, the only launch title they have right now is actually Doom Eternal, and so launching with a um, uh, launch launch launching with a, an FPS is very ballsy because we will very quickly figure out what the latency is with an FPS. <laughs> it's not like they're launching with uh, with a turn based strategy or anything like that. It's this is something that requires an FPS requires some serious uh, uh, some, some seriously low latency. Uh, at this point, I don't think so. It seems that we are headed that way, though. For uh, with that line of thought, I wonder what will happen to companies that surround the PC game market. Yeah, I don't know. That's I mean, it's a good question. I mean, even even Nvidia has already gotten into the video game streaming market. Nvidia has had had the ability to um, do they stream? I don't think they stream the video. Do they stream the video? I think they actually yeah, they stream the video because you can actually stream to your uh, like I showed you guys a couple days ago here. You know, if you have one of these guys, this is an NVIDIA Shield uh, portable, not the tablet. Obviously, it's shaped like a controller. Um, so this little guy right here will actually stream games from my PC to this. Even over Wi-Fi, if I recall. Yeah, even over Wi-Fi. No, sorry, even over um, uh, uh, outside, if you're on Wi-Fi somewhere else. You don't have to actually be on the same local uh, local network for this to work. I actually played, and it was very shitty. I played Destiny on this from my PlayStation 4 because I was able to stream using the PlayStation 4 like app, the PlayStation app that, that I put on this guy. Um, and I was able to play from, where was that? I was in like Monterey or something like that. I was like on vacation and I was just like, let me see if I can do this. I got on, I was like, oh shit, I'm playing Destiny. This is awesome, but it was shit. <laughs> it was, the quality wasn't that great. Um, yeah, so Nvidia already has, like I said, everybody's getting into it. They're not, Google's not first. They're not first. Google and Apple always like to talk about how they're the first to do these things. I will say that they're the first to do this controller thing. Uh, is that really is it up, up, down, down? Wow, that's pretty funny. The Konami code on the back. Uh, guys are so in touch. Um, I will say that the controller actually talking directly to the data center. Data center does sound new to me. I don't know of any other device where the controller actually talks directly to a data center instead of talking directly to some kind of uh, um, host computer device console, something like that. So I feel like that's... Um, that's that's something that is new. So in that case, yes, <laughs> that part is new. Um, so that's it. That's Stadia. That's something that's coming. Um, oh, man, that is uh, I'm genuinely interested to see where they go with this or how this thing performs when it comes out, because everybody's expecting it to do either completely shit or uh, they really are hoping that it actually is, is amazing. But, you know, we have a lot of people getting into that market now, so somebody's going to get it right. What does this mean for people that have data caps, though? Like, if you have a data cap, what are you going to, what are you going <laughs> to, what, what the hell can you even, like, do? Like you, oh, I could play, I could play four hours of games a month. You know, that's cool. You know, as long as I had to budget my time with my data cap. Um, yeah, it's not everybody has the option. I mean, like, some of us, like, like for example, I, I pay extra to, uh, um, to not have a data cap, which is shitty, but I do. I have to because I stream terabytes of data every every month. Um, what does it mean for like, yeah, net net neutrality, right? Exactly. Like, is any particular game service going to get priority over others in the future? We don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, it really depends on whatever your whatever your local um, your local internet provider allows you to play. It seem it seems you know it's almost it seems like it's a lot. But if you already stream Netflix a, like a lot, right? Then I don't feel like this is actually going to have that much of a negative impact. Like some of the people that are saying, "Oh man, I'm gonna have, my data cap is going to be hurting because of this," right? They already probably stream terabytes of data, or you know, however long, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data, uh, just using uh, Netflix. So it's it's you got the budget you got the budget it man you, can, you can't just you can't just play you can't play and watch at the same time t-mobile announced that they would offer home internet service up to 50 megabits uh per second under underserved areas no data cap no data cap or no data cap because even uh i want to say even because we expect them to lie um comcast actually said the same thing is that no data caps but then what they end up doing is throttling you after you go past a certain amount um at least this was the case before 
when I uh, when I had uh, when I had a cap, <laughs> a cap. <laughs> well, yeah, it's because they said it said, oh, there's no cap. It's fine. It's like, well, the why is it so fucking slow? Um, yeah, I'm curious. I mean, like T-Mobile announced that they're going to do that kind of stuff. I'd like to see them actually follow through and with the hardware, uh, like the actual towers and everything to support some of those remote locations that don't necessarily have access to good internet. We will see. Moving on. It's popping to say, Sekiro is great. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, not as great as Demon Souls, though. Play it, Mike. Damn. Is it, uh, is it, uh, is it as Souls-like? Then I am not interested. But I will watch somebody play it. Speaking of Souls-like games, if that is a Souls-like game, uh, somebody actually went and beat all five Souls-born games. Dark Souls, um, in one sitting, with not, without getting hit once. I caught, I started watching when he was going through uh, Dark, Dark Souls 3, the last game, and it was just incredible to see, to see this gentleman, Mr. Uh, Happy Hob, actually go through and, uh, and just basically be all the fucking games without getting hit once. And it was also interesting to see how he did it. Um, yeah, there you go. Demon Souls, Dark Souls, 1, 2, 3, and Bloodborne. The... If you watch the stream, I mean, like, it's super impressive that he did this, but there are certain situations where he basically had to uh, uh, revert back to a previous save, if we use layman's terms, um, because he recognized that there were certain things that mobs would do because of RNG, where basically it's like, okay, well, I will 100% get hit because this mob did something that it's not supposed to do, and so he'll basically um, revert back to a previous save. So there are some instances where it's like, you may want to argue that, oh, well, he didn't really do a complete flow, like a comp like a complete uh, uh, fluid playthrough of the game. But also when you consider that a one 1,000th chance that a boss is going to basically turn a corner and stand in a spot that he fucking never stands in, that's kind of not fair. You know, like, it's like, give him a chance to go back. He still hasn't gotten hit. He still managed to be all the games without getting hit once. And I actually want to go ahead and play this clip for you. Uh, of him actually um, completing the game here. So spoilers, he did it. So here it is. This is the Happy Hob. And uh, let's go ahead and back up here. This is the final boss. Dark Souls 3. Buffering issue for some reason. What the fuck? Why is the clip buffering? <laughs> what the hell? Try it again. One more time. Oh, the clip the clip is messed up. Oh wow, let me move my face. So small no hero! <laughs> we did it! I guess I have my data cap here. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like the clip is uh, starting in the same spot, but uh watching this. I hit my data cap. Just I shouldn't have said anything. Someone's listening. Computer, are you listening? I start listening when I hear the wake word. For more information and to view Amazon's privacy notice, mm -hmm. visit the help section mm -hmm. of the Alexa app. But are you listening right now? Hmm. I don't know that. Okay. Well, I. Uh... Yeah, I don't know whether that clip got messed up or something. I'm not sure, but uh, was that really loud? That was uh, actually not, not, not that loud for me. Cancel. Let me mute this. Um, apologies for that. Go deaf. I know. Unfortunately, you have to actually go and push the button. Uh, so anyways, he did manage to go through and defeat uh, and beat all the games at once. He was he was very teary eyed at the end um and uh and understandably so there's a lot of pressure to put on yourself to complete all of those very difficult games in a row many of us can't even get past the first boss without taking one to the face uh and this guy basically went through and figured out a way to maneuver himself around and through and over basically everything just to get um uh just to just to basically complete all the games and now you could basically say yeah, i did it until the next game releases, and then, then he has to start the whole thing over again, which sucks. But that was actually kind of awesome. Uh, let's see. 
according to The Verge, this is actually a pretty interesting story too. Uh, Kickstarter, you guys know Kickstarter, right? Nice to do it blindfolded. No, yeah, nice to play with. Nice to play with like a like a weird object or something that he's like mapped all the all the parts in and play. It's like, oh, cool! I'm gonna play this with my with this VHS. Ta-da! And I can just sit here and play. I don't know why I have a VHS on my desk. Um, so Kickstarter, some of you guys know them from uh, from Kickstarter, but uh, they are a crowdfunding site that is very, very popular. Uh, their staff is unionizing, which is kind of a big deal because they are the first major tech company to actually, uh, well, I guess it's not official yet, but they will be the first major tech company to unionize. So... That's a big deal. I'm going to go ahead and read this out real quick and actually discuss who these people are. So Kickstarter staff is working with the Office of Professional Employees International Union or the OPEIU, which was founded in 1945. I went to look up these guys to see who they were. They were founded in 1945. This is not some small unionized uh, um, company uh, or collection. They are very widely used. White collar union uh, supporting over 100,000 people between Canada and they have representation in each of the 50 states. So that's huge. This is not, this is not like, you know, some small union, or them all getting together and signing a paper together and saying they're all going to stand together. This is a big union they're working with, a major one. Um, and it says here that Kickstarter staff is unionizing because they want to promote our collective values, inclusion and solidarity, transparency and accountability, and a seat at the table. The organizers write, oh, that's the organizer, uh, noting that the decade that Kickstarter has been around, it's, uh, it's crowdfunding and, and um, uh, brought more than 150,000 projects to life. Kickstarter's efforts are incomplete and these values have failed to manifest in our workplace. We can do better together for ourselves and our industry. So they're basically saying that there are some things that um, Kickstarter can do better and we feel that if, if we feel like if we were to form a union, we can make these things uh, happen. No report if there's anything actually going wrong within Kickstarter. Like even Glassdoor doesn't really give us a really good glimpse of what's happening. They get 25 days of vacation a year. Uh, they have good, good benefits. So nothing that we can see from the outside that would raise a red flag that Kickstarter needs, some, needs a, a union or anything. They actually even says here, they even uh, responded, they said, uh, we're proud of everyone here at Kickstarter, that everyone here at Kickstarter cares deeply about its mission and its future. We're aware that there are team members at Kickstarter who are interested in forming a union, and we look forward to hearing more about our employees' concerns. So, we'll have to wait and see where that goes. Um, hold on. Ugh, we'll have to wait and see where that goes. Uh, there's some polarizing, you know, uh, opinions regarding whether or not we need need to have a uh, whether unions are good or bad, and it's a, a lot of it just stems from people's you know own personal experience. You came over here to bug me, and a puppy's gonna be on the stream later, so you might as well go ahead and get it out of the way. Hi, did you need something? Okay, uh, <laughs> so go on. Um, so yes, Kickstarter is going to get a union. This is a pretty big deal because Kickstarter is in the tech industry. There's no major tech industry, no major tech company that has uh, a union. We've talked about this many times before about how um, because of the way that uh, people and developers, creators, industry folks in general in the games industry need some kind of protection because they essentially just get like picked up to be used for whatever and then they get tossed to the side. We've seen this happen lots of times because of mismanagement, poor decision making, et cetera, uh, made by management. By allowing them, by getting unionized, they put themselves essentially in a position where they're able to now bargain and make sure that the decisions that are being made are for the benefit of the uh, the employees and not just the benefit of people who, you know, are at the top just trying to make a buck. Um, there are some good and there's, there are some, some, dance, some bad sides. Uh, my experience with unions have not, not been necessarily positive living in the Bay Area um, because... We've had, you know, we, we've had our uh, uh, Bay Area rapid transits, our transit system, our public transit system that basically is the lifeblood, the, ar the arterials of, uh, uh, of the Bay Area have actually been uh, locked down because the, uh, because the people that work there, they, they, they went on a, we went on a strike. 
And it was very upsetting because, you know, when you see how much somebody who drives a train that drives itself makes, you're like, wow, you need more money? <laughs> but this was some years ago. Nowadays, I feel like, okay, yeah, now I can see why they need more money. But it really sucks when, they, when, the, when a union holds so much power over the public. And that was, that's, that's, that was my experience with, uh, with unions in, um, in a broader spectrum and not necessarily like, I mean, I've, I've been in a union before. Uh, working various jobs, but nothing, they never really did anything for me that, that I could see. Um, but there's been plenty of, plenty of positive cases where a union has stepped in and actually protected its users. And, you know, and, and, and we've seen a number of times already in the games industry where the attrition rate or the rotation rate, I guess, of, uh, folks going in and out of various, uh, 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 dev studios is like two years, including myself, <laughs> including me two and a half years, three years with Zam. And that was it. I was out. I knew better. I went into it knowing that, you know, every job in the game industry only lasts you two or three years. And sure enough, it happened to me too. So yeah, labor would be, labor, labor unions would be great to represent some of these, uh, some of these users here, users, uh, some of these workers who maybe necessarily can't, um, you know, they have like no, they have no pool. They have no way to get anything done. This side of this is, can now be restrictive to profits and this will, uh, disincentivize high performers. Um, I don't know how to feel about this, especially with some platforms uh, deplatforming people for questionable reasons. I don't know if that's necessarily related to this. I know what you're talking about. I don't know if that's necessarily related to this, though. We're talking about um, workers, unions, um, unless you're talking about, oh, are you talking about a Kickstarter deplatforming people uh, for questionable reasons for maybe something they don't necessarily want to support? I still don't feel like it's necessarily um, that related because we want, you know, we're talking about the workers involved with that. I got stomach pain. Um, and we have that in the UK with uh, Southern trains, lots of strikes, Southern putting up prices and lots of late and canceled trains. Yeah, Ex that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's the negative side to it is that, you know, everybody can basically be held up because, uh, because a particular industry wants to go on strike and it's like, well, great. Now everybody's lives are on hold because of this. And some people can't necessarily afford to have that happen to them. So maybe if you had went on strike in a bubble where only people that get hurt by it are people that are within your um, within your industry or within your, uh, business. And maybe that's great and everything, but what is this? It feels kind of like a uh, sec. They sneak into everything and demand shit while not benefiting anyone really all while peddling the idea that they're helping workers. So yeah, I don't know. Always felt off, but they also work in a company that has shown a focus on the employee and the general well being. So I'm probably just biased. Yeah. Not every company shares those same values. D, um, a lot of them. I mean, like I said, we've seen it's like they have good intentions, but they will ultimately make decisions that are benefit to the business over the benefit to the, uh, the employee. So it's just something that, you know, that without having any kind of, I feel like unionizing with game developers is a need is something that needs to happen because right now they are treated like garbage. They do get hired. And then once the job is done, they're like, well, see you later. I know that you had plans to stay here and retire from this company and whatnot, but we decided to over, we decided to over hire, um, and, uh, make some poor decisions. So we're going to go ahead and let you guys go. Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's something that I do feel like is necessary in this particular industry to strike differently. Those Japanese bus drivers had a strike where they all, they still went to work. They just didn't take fares from anyone. That is. That is pretty interesting. Very specific, of course, but still, that's awesome. I, that's, that's, I, I can't think of, unfortunately, there's no way for that to happen with like the examples I gave with BART, you know, like with the, the subway out here. There's no way they can actually, because the, all the, the funding, all the uh, money is given at the, um, at the gate. And uh, BART has their own police. So if you try to, you know, pass, bypass the gate, they'll just try to arrest you. Um, so you really can't get away with that, I guess, unless you have the police on your side too, the BART police. But yeah, I don't know. But anyways, yeah, so that's a developing story. Kickstarter staff is unionized. something you should keep an eye out for because if they do su succeed in doing this, and this would be a major, a major thing for the games industry. Let's see, what do I have left? Uh, game announcements. I don't typically do these, but this might be kind of fun to kind of just jump into real quick. We have this interesting title here from the creators of Crypto the Necro Dancer, as you guys saw, this is the, um, let me go turn this up a little bit, get a little bit of audio. Okay. Oh, there's audio. There's talking in it. That's why I always hate that. Just play some music. Um, so this is Crypto the Necro Dancer meets Legend of Zelda. Kind of an interesting concept. 
you're going to be basically playing to remixes, to the beat of remixes and, and covers of, uh, or uh, soundtrack pieces from the Legend of Zelda series, which there's plenty of, uh, of soundtrack available out there for that. Uh, you can play as Link, Zelda, or the, I believe the character, what's her name, Callie? No, geez, I forget her name. Um, but yeah, so it is a, uh, uh, it's a something that I feel like is kind of a cool added, or basically it's, it's a, it's a cool new interpretation of the Zelda series because outside of Dynasty Warriors meets Legend of Zelda Hyrule Warriors, there really isn't a whole lot of, um, I guess there really isn't a whole lot of, uh, 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 of spinoff titles that they really allow for. So... Yeah, this is, uh, this is Cadence. Yeah, Cadence, yeah, as the title suggests, yeah, you're basically playing to the beat. Notice that they kind of hop around and everything. I love the, uh, Link, Link to the Past vibe. It's funny that this has a Link to the Past feel, even though it is very much also a Crypt of the Necromancer feel, uh, whereas the new Legend of Zelda title coming out is, um, or it's not a new title, it's, a uh, um, Link's Awakening, right? Link's Awakening, I think, which is essentially Link to the Past for Game Boy, which is now going to be available on, uh, on Switch, and has all these new graphics, look insane. Anyways, yeah. Um, what else? What else? What else? Let's see. What else? That's going to be coming sometime this year. So you can look forward to that. I don't know if it's necessarily a title that I'm going to be interested in because it's a rhythm game. And I know that a lot of you guys think that because I'm a producer that it's something that, uh, that I'd be into, but I don't really, I didn't really like rock band that much or, or guitar here. I played it, but I wasn't really that into it. So if it crosses my switch somehow, I might check it out, but I'm not going to go out of my way for it. Also... Let me see if I have the right one for this. We have another. Is it not going to play? It's not going to play. Grab this. Bring it over. I don't know much about this, except that you guys, although some of you guys will probably be very interested in seeing this particular trailer. If you didn't already know this is coming out. 1 minute 41. This is Bloodlines 2. Uh, this is uh, Vampire the Masquerade. This is what I, I think the thing that I thought was most interesting about this trailer was that right off the bat, it says not actual gameplay. And this plays throughout most of the beginning part here. This or this is this this is specifically for um, the gameplay play throughout or the video, I should say. Uh, I actually don't know hardly anything about the original game because it wasn't a game that I ever played. I never played Vampire the Masquerade. It was like some 15 years ago or something like that. Yeah. But not actual gameplay. We don't really know anything other than, I guess, the teaser. Kind of setting the mood, the tone. Everybody's drinking blood. They're all vampires, blood everywhere. Murdering things. They're going to be heavily including modern politics, identifiers, etc. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't most modern games kind of have like, I mean, I, I understand, I guess, politics. Blood and pearl necklaces, yeah. I guess, yeah, I, I haven't heard too much about what they plan on doing with the actual game itself, but. I mean, the trailer looks cool. For like, yeah, for, as you said, do you, as, as for a non-trailer, we really don't know anything about it. It's like, cool. Bloodlines 2. There you go. And lastly, I guess lastly, huh? Yeah, lastly, we have uh, Cuphead. Cuphead's coming to the Switch. Not so much interesting by itself, but interesting because, and this is actually the intro trailer they put together. It's kind of a funny, uh, just kind of a funny 20s, 30s kind of themed thing we're discussing some stuff and then whatever i'm gonna talk over it. you can watch it later the link will be below but um the most interesting part of the release is that it's microsoft working with nintendo to actually bring achievements to nintendo uh use sorry bring bring xbox live achievements to uh that are that are unlockable through uh playing this game on nintendo they they've also stated that they really, really want Cuphead to be in Smash as well. And I feel like Microsoft is doing everything they can to try to make that happen. Uh, and I really, really, really hope that they, they actually make that happen because I feel like Cuphead would be such an amazing inclusion 
into uh into smash but um how would they even draw it would they keep the 2d i guess they would keep the whole like 2d flat kind of sprite thing kind of you know the character kind of sits there and kind of does a little little shimmy when he, when he plays man that game is so awesome yeah, there he is right there look at it. they're doing the thing um the trailer is so weird and they have like gameplay and everything that plays uh so yeah this is something that's going to be coming in later on the trailer is weird watch that on your own uh we played this through on Steam, or sorry, on uh, on stream, uh, on Steam. But uh, yeah, we played this. Uh, we played this on stream. We actually beat it. We beat the game. And I think we beat it again on uh, on hard mode, or at least we beat the last boss on hard mode. Just to, just just because we wanted to, I think, is what we did. You think you know gaming? No, I don't want can auto play crap. You know, out of here. So that's coming also uh, later. Let's see, man. What else is there? I. Uh, our Discord channel, hashtag Shitty Earth, had a pretty heated, or not heated, a pretty complex discussion regarding uh, uh, UK politics, and then I guess it, uh, but it was 100% civilized. That was something that we want to go ahead and mark. It was the first time in a long time we've had a civilized conversation in there. Actually, in general, we pretty much have civilized conversations, but usually it ends up with one person leaving, at least a little distraught. Uh, and the final, final update for today, before I bring out the puppers for National Puppy Day, uh, the final announcement is... That's right, it's a soldier update, baby. This time, you guys already know it's coming. You guys already know it's coming. This time, it's featuring Soldier Boy yeah. with yeah. his new song, his new single, Zelda. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Draco. <sighs> okay. Green diamonds like Zelda. Ooh. Whole Rockefeller. Ooh. Young Draco that nigga. Ooh. Finger on the trigger. Ooh. Dump his body in a rail. You a pussy ass nigga. Young Draco with 30 million. I can't believe he done, he's done this. I can't believe you've done this. No, I'm serious. I cannot believe that he just can't stop. He just can't stop. Green diamonds like Zelda. Rupees. One. One green. One. It's like a penny. Green diamonds like Zelda. It's been out for a couple weeks now. Uh, what's still, it's still kind of new. Um... Jeez, Kimmy. He just has no fear of anything. When the average person would, you would know. You would know that you don't you don't continually push Nintendo's buttons like this. Uh it says with his fall into parody. Well, yeah, I guess so, until Nintendo decides to go after them and basically, you know, take it down. But as far as we know, that is, uh, that I guess it is a parody, I guess, you know? He, all of this is like after, like he, he released, I don't know if he recorded it after, but let's just say that he did because the song itself is not particularly um, complex where I would think, oh, that took probably a few, a few months to actually put together, right? No, this definitely sounds like something you could put together in, in seriously, in like two hours. Um, I think Nintendo has enough money to make someone disappear. Yeah, where is it? I see. Green diamonds like Zelda. It's it's the same thing over and over again. How long is the song? It's two minutes and fifteen seconds. You see, like you just threw it together. It was just like, oh, okay, cool, and that's it. Man, just, just, just like what? Who the fuck is this guy? Think he is, man? I'm so glad that we have the Yo! we have this Soldier Boy Weekly Update because this guy just keeps on bringing us new stuff every week. It's crazy. Um. <laughs> Well, he says, no, it says it's a direct sample. We don't know if it's a direct sample because that, that sound could be, um, like you could emulate that sound anywhere. Um, so we don't know if it's necessarily a direct sample, but even so, the song's name is Zelda. The, uh, uh, even if it is emulated, the actual like sample is emulated, uh, still, you can't, you, you still can't just like rip off somebody's, you know, very clearly like their song, uh, and then use it. So blatantly, I feel like, and I'm not a copyright lawyer, right? But I think this is just Soldier Boy continuing to try to basically put. Uh, why am I even talking about this? Soldier Boy is being a fucking idiot. That's all. He's just being an idiot. He's just try he's just trying to basically stay relevant by doing dumb shit, and it's resulted in a fucking regular segment on this fucking show, which is stupid. But we're gonna keep talking about it because it's just like a slowest train wreck. It's like the slowest, just. Just, oh man, just over the course of just months. So dumb. So dumb. We should stop giving a spotlight? No! No! 
We will not stop. We have to talk about this because, again, we like train wrecks. <laughs> we like we like this. Why we like car accidents? We got it. We got it. Um. So yeah, uh, Soldier Boy's got a new single out. It's called uh, It's called Zelda. Uh, it may be a few weeks old. I'm sorry. I've been extraordinarily busy these past few weeks. I've not been able to do a, a new show in some time. Um. So I'm sorry. I didn't jump right on it, Kimmy. But fuck this guy. That's it. No, that's not it. I'm gonna go get the dog. Here we go. This is Donut. For those of you YouTube folks who don't watch Twitch stream, this is Donut, miniature Dotsy, mixed with something else. I'm sorry, not miniature, regular Dotsy mixed with something else. We don't know what. We have no idea what. We'll find out as it gets older. He's a good boy. He's 13 weeks old now. Oh, we're 13 weeks old. Uh, he really likes these little bones. You want it? Here you go. <laughs> he goes potty outside like a good boy. Um, and he's gonna leave. Don't leave. We gotta keep doing this here. <laughs> Just get comfy. Here you go. Right here. There you go. Right there. Okay. Okay. Wag. 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 Oh, move my camera. Move myself all over the place. There we go. There we go. Where are you going? No, stay here. Stay here. <laughs> all right. So there you go. National Puppy Day, March twenty third. Also, reminders. My wife's birthday, March twenty third. So. Make sure you at Mumbly Toes, happy birthday. And then uh, also welcome Donut to the, uh, to the stream family. So that's it. That's your news for today. Fuck it, soldier boy. Talk to me, cousin, in front of the dog. Uh, I guess we'll see you guys. Uh, I guess we'll see you guys later. Urgh, stay here. Stay here. Stop running away. Stop trying to run away. Love me. <laughs> that's it. And thanks for joining me, aka Mike B. Donut. Chat. Bye.